Hey everyone, welcome to our presentation about hockey hip. My name is Jason Smith. I'm a physiotherapist at Grand River Sports Medicine. And together, Sasha Gay and I are providing you with the best content we can find to try to keep you guys healthy throughout the season. Uh, we're both very passionate about working with young athletes, their coaches, <clears throat> um, their parents, and their families in general to try to keep you healthy throughout the season, prevent those small injuries that cause big hangups and to provide you with information that's hopefully going to keep you healthy uh, long beyond when you're a hockey player as well. I've included both our emails there. If you have any questions about the presentation, feel free to reach out to both Sasha or I, and uh, please follow us on our social media there at GRSM Center, and you can discover more content that we post on there. So we're gonna be talking about hockey hip prevention and treatment of common so Sasha joined our GRSM team in 2019. Sasha and I actually worked together previously at a job in Guelph, which was how we knew each other. Uh, I started at GRSM in 2017 and Sasha came on shortly after. Uh, Sasha, like I said, really enjoys working with young athletes and their families, has a broad variety of experience. You'll see the F camped in her name there. <clears throat> that compromises the equivalent of five years of postgraduate education. So after she's finished her physiotherapy master's degree, she's gone on and done additional education to try to educate herself as best as possible on orthopedic injuries. So safe to say she's an expert in the field. Um, she became a sport medicine fellow throughout that process as well and did her sport physio fellowship at the University of Guelph. And she's worked with a large variety of sports teams providing medical coverage on field um, as well as you know, comprehensive treatment in the clinic. I have a similar background to Sasha in that uh, I've attained my FCAMP certification as well. So again, that comprehensive five-year education regarding uh, orthopedic injuries. And I have a, a varied background. I did my undergrad in kinesiology at Western, my physiotherapy at McMaster University. Um, I was the team physiotherapist for the University of Guelph men's rugby team for three years. And I have a variety of sport coverage outside of that as well. So again, some on-field coverage, working with high-level athletic teams, and also the uh, in-clinic coverage as well. I'm also a certified personal trainer and use that knowledge to guide my exercise therapy in addition to the uh, exercise therapy that we learned through physio school and through additional education. Again, we're, uh, we're really just pleased to partnership with KMHA and you know, give you guys the best uh, information we can to, to help keep you healthy. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about what is hockey hip exactly? What do I mean by that? Why does it happen and why should we care? What happens if we don't address it? And what can we do about it as physios and as athletes? And that's going to include when to seek treatment, how we can self-manage it without the help of a practitioner, and some exercise therapy. And we're going to focus a lot on that there'll be a supplementary video to our exercise therapy after the presentation. <clears throat> I wanna orient you to some hip movement terms that are going to be important today. So these are uh, movements that we move our hip in in relation to our body. And we're gonna be talking about some of these and they are technical terms. So for, for use and ease of terminology, I wanna orient you to specifically hip extension. So hip extension is bringing our leg back behind our body. That second picture you see there. The first picture, hip flexion, bringing our leg forward or a knee up towards our chest. Abduction, the way I was taught is we're abducting our leg from our body. We're taking it away from the center line of our body and adducting, we're adding it back towards our body or reaching all the way across. And then external and internal rotation of the hip. Again, you'll see on the external rotation, we're rotating our foot and our entire leg outwards. So our foot points away from our midline. Internal rotation, we point at the opposite, pointing in towards our midline. But we'll come back to these movement terms as we go. What is hockey hip? So hockey hip is a common pattern of muscular tension seen in hockey players that leads to increased injury risk. Okay, this will ultimately lead to mobility restrictions in the hip, hip joint muscular strains. We're gonna focus primarily on those two today because I think that's most important for your age group. Uh, eventually it can lead to hip joint impingement, 
early development of hip arthritis, and we'll talk about cam and pincer deformities that happen, low back pain, abdominal wall muscular strains or sports hernias, and knee injuries as well, which is a little bit more specific to your population to the, the knee injuries. So again, this hockey hip is an excessive pattern of tension primarily in our hip flexors and external rotators. So the muscle groups that bring our knee up towards our chest and rotate our foot away from our body, okay? If you think about the hockey stride, again, we are uh, putting ourselves in hip flexion with that forward trunk lean we do to try to gain our fast forward propulsion in hockey. And we're externally rotating with our stride when we push off that foot pushing out to the side. Eventually, this pattern of excessive tension will lead to postural changes, flexibility or mobility deficits, and strength deficits as well. This is going to predispose us to pain, injury, and reduced performance. And if left unchecked, this will slowly affect your hockey performance over time. And there are simple things that we can do to mitigate the effects of this pattern and to leave you fully mobile, as strong as possible, so you have the best performance on the ice and reduce your injury risk throughout the season. <clears throat> so which muscle groups are we talking about? So to orient you to this, this diagram here, let's see if we can. So right at the center here, this is our spine. We're looking at it from the front, okay? So here's our spine. Oops. Here is the front of our hip joint, and here is our kneecap, okay, right down at the bottom. So now that we're oriented there, we see our hip flexor muscles that are highlighted in yellow here. It's not important that you remember the muscles specifically, but if you're curious to look them up, you can look up their anatomy, so where they originate and insert. And generally, when those two points come together, the origin and insertion, they shorten or contract the muscle, and that produces movement of our limb. One of the most common muscles that we're going to strain is our rectus femoris muscle, and that uh, muscle is unique because it crosses two joints, both our hip and our knee. Okay, and we'll see that uh, right down the front side there. All right, so this muscle is one group that's going to adaptively shorten, and all we mean by that is its flexibility is going to reduce, and it's going to get less flexible over time. So the opposite movement that it does, hip extension, is gonna end up being limited. Our hip external rotators or our gluteal muscles are also going to adaptively shorten or become very tight and inflexible. So again, here is our spine. We're looking at somebody from the back, looking at someone's bum. Here is the top of our hip joint here, okay? And there's our, our hip joint proper right in there. So we've got these deep external rotator muscles that go throughout the backside. We've got our gluteal muscles along the side there too. Pardon my penmanship here, I'm, I'm working from a laptop. Hopefully we get the idea. Okay, we're gonna come back to these muscles. Don't worry too much about the anatomy. We just wanna know in general, it's the muscles in the front of our hip and also in the muscles in the back of our hip that we're gonna get tight. So why does this happen? Again, we already mentioned the posture necessary for skating. So that powerful forward trunk lean, we're leaned over, chest towards the floor, we're bent at the hips. That's gonna be our hip flexion and why we shorten through there. And then our push off during our stride or forward propulsion is our hip external rotation. Again, chronic stress on these muscle groups because they're working so hard in these shortened positions is going to lead to that adaptive shortening or tightening. Adaptive shortening over time will limit your mobility for complex hockey skills such as turning, stopping, changing directions, doing crossovers, as well as shooting, and many other athletic positions outside of hockey, including running, walking, lateral or sideways movement, and squatting or crouching. We'll chat about each of those as well. <clears throat> so here we see two positions. We've got Austin Matthews up in the top left there. We're just demonstrating uh, his skating position. So again, that forward trunk lean, you see that angle of his torso, he's bent forward towards the ground rather than standing nice and upright like we would when we're running. And down at the bottom there, we see Connor McDavid, and he's giving us a good example of our stride, our push off, getting that hip into abduction and external rotation. 
So those muscles on the back of his body, his gluteal muscles and those deep external rotators are pushing off and working very hard in that position. So what is the result of all these shortenings that happen through our muscle, all this tension that we're developing in our stride position? The result is excessive anterior pelvic tilt. Okay, so if you see on the diagram on the left here, our pelvis is supposed to be nice and level, going right across that line there. Okay, if you picture our pelvis like a bowl of water, okay, so our hip area is like a bowl of water. We don't want that water to dump out the front, meaning we're tilted forward, or to dump out the back, meaning we're tilted too far back. We want it nice and level through there. Because of the tightening of our hip flexors, again, you see on that diagram on the right, the hip flexors are at the front, okay? And our gluteal muscles tightening in the back, it's going to bring that pelvis into a forward dumped position. Terrible line there, I know, sorry about that. But again, that bowl of water is spilling out the front of our body, spilling out the front of our shorts, okay? We wanna get that bowl nice and level again. So how do we do that? So again, before we talk about that, let's again highlight those movements that are gonna be restricted. Primarily, we're gonna have restrictions of the hip's ability to extend, that foot to push off behind our body, like in a big running stride. Restrictions of adduction, so bring that foot across our body, like in a crossover or lateral movement, as well as the hip's ability to internally rotate or that toes to turn inward towards the midline of our body. So here are some examples of the way we use these movements in a hockey context. So again, we've got that same picture of Austin Matthews up on the top. We've got that forward trunk flexion. You can see the internal rotation at his hip as he prepares to take a shot. Okay, so internal rotation. Again, that foot is rotating towards the midline of the body. And in this case, we can really see that angle at his knee. So it's his femur, his long thigh bone, rotates inwards, it's gonna turn the foot out. You'll see that again in the exercise therapy we do. We see the same pattern with Sidney Crosby down there on the bottom left. Again, that hip coming into internal rotation, really forceful stride, allowing him to push off of that inside edge as he propels himself forward. Connor McDavid up in the top. I'm sorry if I'm blocking that picture partially there with the video we see a very powerful adduction as he starts his crossovers. Uh, I believe this was during the fastest skater contest, which he won one year. So again, that foot coming across the midline of the body, pushing off using that outside edge of his left leg. Then on the very bottom, we see Victor Hedman, hardest shot in the league in 2022. Uh, this is a still frame of Again, you're gonna see on that back leg, his hips internal rotation that he uses to power and push off that inside edge as he's gearing up for a shot. We go to some other athletic movements. We see this very iconic picture on uh, Andre de Grasse Tyson, a Canadian. He ends up coming in second in this race behind you know who, Usain Bolt. And they're having a little moment here. Usain saying, you're not getting me this time but pay attention to their hip position. So again, they're going into very powerful hip extension, the ability of that foot and that knee to come behind our hip joint and propel us forward. Very, very important in running if we want to achieve maximum speed. And some other examples on the bottom left there, we'll see Kelly Starrett. Kelly Starrett has a website called uh, thereadystate.com, formerly the Mobility Wad or Workout of the Day. Kelly's been working with CrossFit athletes for years, is a huge proponent of spending time in the squat. <clears throat> this, uh, these motion restrictions are ultimately going to affect our ability to squat as well. And I haven't touched on that yet, but we will touch on later when we talk about hip impingement. But see how close Kelly's knees are up to his chest there. Just keep that in mind for later on in the presentation. And then the other video here, the other picture, sorry, the greatest of all time, arguably. Sorry if there's any LeBron fans out there. Michael Jordan, we see him planting on that right leg, trying to cut back. Again, that hip internal rotation. We see that hip rotating inwards, that knee coming inside of the foot, which allows him to push back and get away from his opponent. Okay. So 
we've got these mobility deficits that happen, but what's the consequence if they're left unchecked? So what, we're not that flexible? Well, they can very often lead to muscular strains. Muscular strains involve damage to the muscle fibers and connective tissue, ranging from minor disruption to complete tearing, which again would be rare. Typically, they result in decreased strength, pain with contraction or use of the muscle, and decreased flexibility or the ability of the muscle to stretch. Okay, we have a diagram of a muscle fiber here. Nothing too important there for you guys to remember, just that we see that uh, tendon connecting to a bone and it's going into those muscle fibers. That connective tissue is embedded throughout to form the integrity of that muscle. And all of those tissues can be affected if we get a muscular strain. Again, the most common muscles are our hip flexors. So those muscles along the front of the hip that bring our knee up towards our chest. And when they shorten, they bring us into that anterior pelvic tilt that we talked about. And the next muscle group that's you know most common to strain in a hockey context are our groin muscles or our adductors. We've listed a few different muscles there that are, are common to strain. Again, if you want to look those up, you're welcome to do so. So when should we seek treatment? So we think we have a little muscle strain. How bad is it? Is it going to get better with time? When should we seek treatment? So if your injury is affecting your ability to play hockey or compete in any athletic activities at your highest desired ability, seek treatment right away. I'm always biased, of course, as a physio. Even if you don't plan on coming back for continued sessions with physio, you know you're limited by time or finances, I always recommend coming in for an initial assessment where we try to uh, figure out the target tissue that's injured and educate you as best as possible and give you a plan on what things are and are not safe for you to do, how to properly self-manage, and get you set on the right track so you have the best chance of recovering from that injury as best as possible. Some people will require a little bit more treatment. Um, but again, that's a, a plan that we come up together between the physio, you the athlete, and potentially your parents and coaches as well. Our primary goal as physiotherapists, again, is to educate you on your injury and empower you to manage it independently. So as soon as we feel like you're doing a good job on your own, we send you away on your own. We might follow up less frequently at that point to do progressions as you progress back toward your sport. but. We want to educate you guys so you can you can treat yourselves essentially. If we if we get people to the point where they're treating themselves, we're both very happy. Proper early management can prevent uh, an acute injury from becoming chronic or recurring, which we see a lot. People come in and they're like, yeah, you know, I've had a few groin tweaks over the years, but this one was really bad and it's not getting better. You know, maybe if we came in initially and identified some factors that are predisposing us to those injuries, we could prevent those from recurring or again from becoming chronic where it's something that's sore every day or always with activity. We certainly don't want to get to that point. Some red flags or reasons to seek treatment. Sharp pain felt during activity that lingers or is recurring in nature. So it happens every time we try that activity. Pain afterwards with walking or activities of daily, daily living and other athletic positions. So you might be pain-free at rest, but once we try to walk or we walk too far, that hip pain starts bothering us again, or that groin pain starts bothering us again. Um, and certainly pain that returns upon an attempt to return to hockey. So again, being pain-free at rest does not equal being pain-free at activity. The demands of hockey are far beyond the demands of regular life, walking to and from school, sitting in a chair, watch TV. Uh, we want to make sure that we're ready to go back to, to sport. Okay. <clears throat> what to expect from the initial assessment? So we fancy ourselves detectives when it comes to trying to figure out your injury. We're going to ask you a lot of questions. It's going to seem totally overkill, but we want to make sure that we get your story right. We want to make sure that we have all the details so that we can form the story of why this injury happened in the first place. You know, was it simply that it was a improper movement that your body was not ready for? Were you fatigued going into that game? Is it a general overuse pattern where we've done way too much activity too soon for what your body was ready for? And in order to know that, we need to know your history. So your past medical and injury history, what injuries have you had before, uh, the pain pattern and behaviors. So 
what movements or positions make the pain or the injury feel worse? And conversely, is there anything that makes it feel really good? We want a comprehensive activity log, so your current activity and your desired activity, and that includes past activity too. So let's say you're getting back into hockey season, but you had a very relaxed summer, your body is not necessarily prepared for the rigors of hockey. We want to know where that you know body was prepped for leading into the season so we can prevent that from happening again. Uh, we also want to discuss your goals for sport and activity moving forward, both in the short and the long term. So if you have any short term goals, for example, tournaments you're hoping to play in, really important games, or we have any long term goals like, hey, you know, I really just want to be a healthy hockey player for the longevity of my career and prevent these injuries from recurring. That helps us know where you're at, where your motivation is to get better. Excuse me for a minute. So when we go into the objective exam, so we've talked about the subjective things, what you've told us. The objective exam is us watching you move, and trying to gain information on that to help diagnose your injury. So we're going to put you through a movement assessment and a postural examination, as well as a traditional orthopedic exam where we check out your range of motion, your strength, and maybe put you through some special tests specific to uh, the structures that we think may be at fault. And then we get into developing treatment. And this is done uh, in conversation with you know, the physio, myself, talking to the athlete, you, about what those goals are, what you think is realistic for your time frame when we chat about exercise therapy. How can we integrate that into your other exercise therapy? Maybe you have some dry land training that we could do with that. What sort of activity can you do? We want to get you back to activity as safely as possible as soon as we can. But again, we don't want to uh, lead to that long-term overuse that causes injuries in the future. So we're giving you comprehensive education. We will give you some exercise therapy, something to start on at home and potentially integrate into practices with your team. There might be some manual therapy. This includes soft tissue massage, soft tissue release techniques, uh, some joint mobilization where we're trying to increase the movement of that joint. Uh, we may include some modalities such as acupuncture, dry needling, or IMS. And we can talk about that at a later date, but that can be very helpful for injuries. Or some taping or tensor bandaging to try to protect the underlying injury. If we're going to go back to play for a very important game, for example, we just want to protect that to make sure that, you know, we have a little bit of extra layer of uh, added support there. We might take a videotape of you doing some of your athletic movements to highlight some movements that we think may be contributing to your injury, or we might try to video your exercise therapy so you can see you performing it in the clinic and have that along with the report we give you for home to maintain your, your good form with all your exercises. Um, give you some visual feedback on the biomechanics of, of how you're moving as well. And then we can always refer to additional professionals if that's needed. We have uh, some very good sports doctors we work with, as well as other professionals within the community. Um, and in-house, we have massage therapy, chiropractic, the whole host of individuals that can be helpful for you to, to see as well. Again, with a discussion uh, with you guys to see what you're, what you're aiming for. So we're going to go through the next few slides relatively quickly. Um, these slides may not pertain to young athletes under 20 years of age quite as much, but if this anterior pelvic tilt, if that position persists and we keep having this hockey hit pattern over time, the consequence are going to be the following injuries. It's going to become much more important as you get into your 20s, certainly more so in your 30s, 40s, 50s. If you guys want to be hockey players for life or you want to have the ability to be active for life, we want to make you aware of these injuries so that you can detect them if they start to come on and do our best to prevent them from coming on. <clears throat> so hip impingement. Impingement is a fancy word for pinching. That pinching occurs at the front of the hip joint. It's caused by two or more structures compressing into each other. Okay, So our hip flexors may be compressing into the front of our hip joint. Our hip joint itself may be compressing into itself. So our femur may be compressing into our socket or the acetabulum. Um, there's lots of structures that can, can pinch each other, and it, it does lead to that painful pinching when we're down in that deep squat position or we're doing a knee drive, knees up towards our chest, like running uphill, Killian Jordan on the bottom there, very accomplished ultra runner. Our technical term is femoral acetabular impingement. 
you really want to impress your friends, you can uh, remember that one, or FAI for short, for short. Again, it can result from chronic postural deficits, that excessive anterior pelvic tilt, and it can result from recurrent muscular injuries as well. So if you have recurrent hip flexor strains, for example, that accentuate that you know, compression we're getting at the front of our hip joint, that's certainly going to predispose you to, to hip impingement. Over time, this can lead to bony changes within our hip, very common in hockey players, cam and pincer deformities. So on the bottom left uh, diagram there, what we're, we're looking at here is a hip from the front. So the ball of our femur in the socket of our hip joint. And we're gonna see in that red zone there, we've developed this little pincer deformity. So right on the socket of our acetabulum or our pelvis, uh, our body has laid down extra bone there to try to give support to the joint. But what that leads to is when our knee comes up towards our chest, that bone stops it from coming. Very painful. So it's going to limit our knee towards our chest hip flexion. You can also have a, a cam deformity, which is picture number two right in the center there. And that's that the actual head of our femur or the ball part of the ball and socket joint has a little bit of extra bone growth there. Again, leading to the same result inability to flex that hip fully, and those bones poking into each other. And more commonly, we have a little bit of a combination where both the cam and the pincer deformity happen as well. Uh, this is most common in age 30 plus, but certainly can happen in younger ages from acute traumatic injuries or micro trauma over time. Low back pain is extremely common in hockey players. We will see this in a young age group as well. Again, that excessive anterior pelvic tilt is going to lead to compression through the low back there. So we see again on our diagram, on that right side, we've got short and tight through the low part of the low back there, our lumbar extensors, because of that anterior pelvic tilt, because of the excessive tight hip flexors, we're compressing all the structures in our back, okay? Namely our posterior facet joints, and our, our lumbar paraspinal muscles. Generally, this is gonna require some sort of stretching out of that tissue, moving into a forward flex position, leading to the root cause of the issue, adding mobility to those hip flexor muscles. Abdominal wall muscular strains are very common as well. They can present as groin pain or hip pain, but generally involve strain of the uh, abdomen muscles or our abs. Again, those muscles are lengthened out in that anterior pelvic tilt position. So we're developing inability to produce force uh, within that lengthened out position. Muscles are never as strong when they're stretched out. It's gonna predispose us to this happening. Uh, in rare cases, you will go on to require surgery with these, but again, that's more common age 30 plus. <clears throat> Knee injuries are something that are fairly common that we see in a young age group. Uh, and it's because this hip internal rotation deficit. So again, from that pattern of tension we see, we can no longer internally rotate our hip. It can lead to this dynamic knee valgus compensation. So if we picture our, our two knee bones, okay? So we've got our femur and our tibia lining up here. Most of us are in a slight valgus, which means that our, our foot is gonna come slightly away from the, the center line of our body, okay? But if we don't have the ability of our hip to internally rotate, turn inwards, that valgus is going to be accentuated when we do knee bending movements. That's gonna put lots of stress on the inner tissues of our knee, our MCL, our medial meniscus. It can lead to maltracking of our patella, patellar dislocations and patellofemoral syndrome, and can contribute to ACL injuries as well. Definitely all stuff we want to avoid, super easy to avoid with some, some gentle training. And again, I'm not trying to scare you guys, but more highlight the fact of injuries that can happen and injuries that we commonly see. You don't need to know these in detail. You just need to know that the exercises you're gonna do are gonna be helpful to prevent these things. So moving on to exercise therapy. Our general goals with exercise therapy are to address that excessive anterior pelvic tilt and also address our mobility and strength deficits. We're gonna develop postural awareness throughout posterior pelvic tilt. You'll see that dog down in the corner, tail tucked between his legs, moving that pelvis into a posterior pelvic tilt. So think dog tucking his tail, 
and then the anterior is the dog wagging his tail or sticking his tail up towards the ceiling. Okay. We're going to stretch out our excessively tight tissues, our hip flexors and our gluteal muscles and deep external rotators. We're going to pair that with some mobility exercises for internal rotation and extension, movements that we're missing. And we're going to strengthen our leg and lengthen or weak tissues, both our abdominals and our hamstrings. You guys can move on to the supplementary exercise videos at this point, but if you want a little bit more detail, keep following along here. We're almost done. So our stretches for our hip flexors, we have six different varieties here, all ranging in uh, difficulty from easiest to hardest. So level one is the easiest, level three C is going to be the hardest. Choose one variety per session, depending on how you're feeling. So we always want to try to maintain good form with that posterior pelvic tilt for our hip flexor stretching. Uh, so choose the variety that you can do for the prescribed holding time. Your prescribed holding time may vary depending on the advice from your physiotherapist, but in general, for prevention purposes, a 60 second hold for three repetitions on each side can be very beneficial. We're also going to, also going to stretch out our gluteals and our hip uh, deep external rotators. We have three options for that. And again, you'll see that in the supplementary exercise video, ranging in difficulty from the easiest level one to the hardest level three. Then we move into strength and motor control. We're going to do seated hip internal rotation to try to restore the hips ability to move into internal rotation. And then we're also going to restore our hip extension by strengthening our gluteal muscles moving from level one to four and our abdominal muscles moving from level one to four. Okay, and check out the exercise videos for that. Ultimately, we want to develop postural awareness throughout the day, trying to get out of that habit of letting that pelvis dump forward, that bowl of water to spill out the front of our shorts. We're going to re-level that so the pelvis is nice and level throughout the day. You can do this by practicing that position when you're seated, standing, in single leg stance, uh, try to increase that holding time over time, and eventually do that with athletic position as well. And your physio can help guide you through this. Here's a sample program for you guys. This would be something typical that would be provided to an athlete. Again, we always want to individualize our therapy. So some athletes may spend more time on the hip flexors than they will in the gluteal group, just depending on what's particularly tight. And we want to find the appropriate entry point to uh, get people to stretch effectively and try to mobilize those, those uh, mobility deficits and strengthen the muscles that need to be strengthened. But you can have a, a quick look at this program and, and check it out and try to use it as a template for, for making your program as well. Okay. For example, <clears throat> if we go into the stretching section, we see hip flexor stretch level number three, 60 second hold for three reps. That's an example. You might be able to do hip flexor stretch level 3A or 3C. You have to try it out, follow along the, follow along the exercise video, and see what you can tolerate. Okay? Thank you guys so much. Uh, it's great to have this partnership with Kitchener Minor Hockey. We hope you find this information helpful. Again, feel free to email either Sasha or I if you have questions. Uh, specifically email me for this presentation and Sasha for the ones that she's done and please check out the attached exercise videos they'll be slightly more interesting in this presentation I hope best of luck guys let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you soon